first of all, thank you uh, for your invitation and thank you all for taking your time and joining this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm Koichi Takada and today I will be presenting, well, in fact, this was our first international project, the gift shops uh, in National Museum of Qatar, uh, completed in 2018. Um, the title uh, Organic Journey uh, is really to show a nature inspired architecture, uh, a way of thinking, if you like, more journey driven than a linear approach, and how my practice uh, grew organically. Today um, I'm presenting from Sydney, where my practice is based. As you can see, uh, Sydney is a uh, beautiful city and uh, I feel that nature and city are in balance um, or at least it used to be. A um, bit of my practice uh, introduction. Um, my practice is currently working on active project, not only in Australian cities, but also around the rest of the world. Um, this is um, staff number development. My practice uh, was established 2008 uh, during the global financial crisis. Um, there was almost no project. Um, as you can see, this was the beginning. I started uh, by myself uh, really, uh, and uh, it slowly built up uh, towards 2020. We are currently around uh, 40 to uh, 40 people practice. Um, this red dot um, is when we won the international competition for uh, the project in Qatar uh, and began working. And this is when we delivered the project uh, to the practical completion. So as you can see, uh, running of the practice over let's say the decade uh, of the rapid growth uh, that we experience in somewhat uh, relevant in today's discussion, looking at uh, the modern modernization of the Qatar and, uh, and, 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 and how we uh, uh, grew with this project uh, in terms of staff numbers and equally uh, transition from a uh, more interior-based project to architecture from small project, medium size to uh, large project. So a bit of a uh, project. This was, uh, we, we draw inspiration from nature and this was a very first project drawing inspiration from cave. And we essentially built uh, this cozy uh, restaurant that uh, create this uh, acoustic effect, just like a natural cave. So when you're in this restaurant, uh, it is kind of pleasant dining experience, just like being in nature. Um, then we sort of start developing the theme and, and, and look at this uh, cultural aspect of nature uh, in Japan where Cherry Blossom is very much uh, in a spring festival um, and, and symbolize the cultural significance of gathering. So we grew uh, this timber structure and timber piece around the column that we discover when we enter the space. And, and dining around, dining under these big trees uh, uh, together with everyone and signifies that symbolic meaning of uh, gathering and dining under the one big trees. Another restaurant that um, we uh, uh, have accomplished in Sydney, uh, this is the maple tree in Japan. It, this was in autumn. Um, we uh, incorporate this shaded uh, structure that essentially uh, creates the movement of the uh, breeze uh, condition uh, space uh, that normally is stagnant, but we created this movement of, of wind that, uh, you know, create the pleasant dining experience. Again, incorporating that uh, natural um, experience, translating into artificial environment. 
um, this was another project that looked to the native trees uh, in Australia, in which case this was the fig tree that could grow uh, over 20 meters in cantilever. Um, we created this marketplace. And again, uh, we were struck with this uh, rather uh, six columns that uh, the original architects struggled struggle to delete. Sorry, um, struggle to delete. Um, so we uh, uh, took this negative aspect of space and, and looked, to, um, looked at it as an opportunity to grow the forest-like structure so that the people can come to uh, celebrate um, the local market. So every week the market uh, would change under this tree and create a very symbolic meaning of uh, community gathering. Uh, this was uh, the time in which uh, the project in Qatar, and we look to the inspiration in Desert Cave uh, in Qatar, but as you can see, uh, uh, my project before this was relatively a small project, and uh, uh, we were discovered by the clients because of the use of natural materialities and, and perhaps the way in which we express the natural or perhaps the cultural heritage in some aspect and embody that in an architectural form. And then our practice uh, start to gain architectural project. Uh, we drew inspiration from a Great Barrier Reef uh, in Australia and, and, and brought that element of nature uh, and, and place, created this space on top of building that people can go up and, and gather and enjoy uh, and uh, under the sky. So this becomes a more democratic space uh, in a very condensed uh, city urban living environment and then created this sort of a plaza-like space on the rooftop uh, uh, with uh, the interaction of the nature. Uh, the Wululu is located in heart of Australia uh, we very much like uh, the texture and the color and the formation uh, of this uh, rock uh, and, and, and brought it back uh, to the uh, city, uh, you know, the CBD in Sydney and use of the traditional brick materiality that uh, come from the past and somehow amalgamated into the uh, heritage precinct of the Sydney and, and, and created this continuity from the past that represent perhaps uh, the new future that in relationship with our uh, cultural heritage. Uh, Shaped by the wind, again, I look to the uh, 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 local, in this case, the Victorian uh, nature that's been translated uh, uh, in a development uh, project in, in Melbourne South and uh, shaped by the wind, uh, very much a windy areas. And we try to create aerodynamic shape uh, and then the form that, that to tame the, uh, the wind and created this uh, uh, space that uh, uh, work with uh, the neighboring building and uh, uh, creating present um, a pleasant space that people can walk under and uh, enjoy uh, the in-between public space. So infinity, uh, project, uh, we look to um, a drawing inspiration from the nature in terms of uh, climate change and I suppose the crisis. And part of this crisis uh, can uh, generate a new possibility in architecture uh, that in this instance, uh, in a concrete heat island effect uh, in Sydney, by way of opening up a building mass, this would uh, uh, draw in a cool wind and a cool breeze and, uh, and cools down the buildings uh, naturally. Uh, the use of natural means more so than the mechanical means. In other words, the reducing the impact uh, by working with the nature in a specific orientation. And also uh, in winter, this opening would draw a natural daylight into the public space that created at the heart of the buildings. We also looked at the um, uh, paperberg as a native species 
uh, to create uh, this restaurant that has no waste. So, um, you know, the organic food, the food itself the, with a chef, uh, we, uh, we wanted to show the, the world that this part of a pop-up restaurant can be created in a sustainable sense that uh, temporary, but uh, would not create the no waste and parts of the material would be recycled. Uh, the waterfalls uh, is the project that we currently um, uh, developing in Brisbane. Um, Australia is a very uh, harsh environment facing west. So we are cascading uh, 180 meter of the waterfall to cool the uh, building itself, but also the surrounding environment uh, to create this uh, uh, very unique environment that uh, works with the subtropical weathers. Um, uh, the project that we, are, uh, uh, we have proposed in California, uh, in this instance in LA, we look to this forest uh, uh, and draw inspiration from this oldest tree in the world. So these trees, as you can see, the person is standing next to it is about a thousand years old and the, one of the oldest trees in the world. In other words, the symbol of sustainability. So we uh, wanted to create uh, the healthiest place you can live, ideally, in the downtown LA. Um, and, uh, and then underneath the canopy, as uh, people in LA call it, the flying skirt of Marilyn Monroe. And then as opposed to the American cultural icon and the reference to the place uh, itself, uh, but in other words, transforming this area uh, from traffic oriented society into a walkable place. Um, and, and recently, um, we are more driven by creating building that is carbon neutral, and perhaps even to create the carbon positive uh, regenerative architecture uh, uh, that rely, uh, re not rely on the grid, but sustain uh, by itself and help uh, you know, offset uh, the carbon emissions. And one of these projects that recently uh, proposed, and this would be hopefully under construction uh, and later this year, uh, is uh, the urban forest. So one of the world's most densely forested uh, vertical gardens. And obviously uh, we are not the first one to, to do this, but uh, we need to evolve as an architect to keep uh, working on this principle of living architecture. And let us say that the uh, concrete and steel alike, I call it as a dead materialities. Uh, and we need to move on to create something that is uh, more uh, in harmony with nature or rather bringing, reconnecting with nature in an urban city setting. Um, one of the important aspects of this is the public domain. Uh, where uh, we would have an information center. So this undercroft of this building would be given back to the community and uh, as a public space adjacent to the existing public park. So people can come here not only to enjoy the park uh, feature, but also learn about the building. Uh, in sustainability and the performance. So if you want to know about the species of the plant or how this building particular performing in terms of carbon emission or reducing the impact of the greenhouse effect, emission effect, you can learn, come here and learn about this building. And, and equally uh, with uh, a great client, uh, we are thinking of creating the ecology in having the farmland uh, nearby Brisbane uh, so, so that we can grow this tree sustainably. And this is the part that perhaps uh, is the next step to what we have seen in the past, but creating again the ecology in itself uh, and architecture does not stop at the building, but it's, it is a part of building this ecology is, is what matters. Um, uh, this one, uh, the last project before I go into the project in Qatar, uh, we call it the sunflower house. And we were quite excited about the potential of this project that's commissioned by Bloomberg Green is that as you know, uh, the sunflower uh, follow the path of the sun. So in other words, 20th century architecture was very much a static 
uh, uh, creation, but in moving to uh, more, uh, moving away from the industrial uh, modernism to uh, uh, living in a sense that the natural revolution in making living architecture, it is about the motion. So, so the solar panels uh, will follow the path of sun in achieving more than 40% of the generation of the electricity. And, and then also other good principle that uh, we uh, inherited in the, in, you know, we uh, integrated in design such as water collections and also uh, reducing and passive means of uh, cooling and, uh, and so on and so forth. So in other words, achieving the carbon positive architecture uh, that um, can be uh, uh, sy symbolic for uh, our future living. Um, and today, uh, my practice, uh, we talk about a mission in creating organically inspired places, uh, you know, so that the world can reconnect with more natural, intuitive, and conscious future. Um, and, uh, and, and moving on to uh, a project in Qatar, um, and I'm not sure how many of you have visited Qatar, but if not, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, while you may associate a neighboring city like Dubai, Abu Dhabi uh, with more entertainment uh, or recreational uh, aspect of uh, uh, the cities, Qatar's ambition is to make Doha uh, so-called the artistic uh, cultural hub of the region. I want to explore today and hopefully open up discussion with you around the impact of rapid change. One of the key discussion we had with a client was heritage meets innovation. In our modern world uh, of constant change, how do we keep our human values, tradition, traditional and perhaps the cultural identities? Qatar's transformation, um, well, really began uh, with their discovery of oil and the gas. Uh, this was during 60s and 70s. So it's relatively new uh, discoveries. And this discovery, of course, has changed the country uh, more than any other nation. Around, uh, perhaps around 60, 70 years ago, um, let's say not so long ago, uh, if you can imagine uh, this small emirate influenced by a uh, Bedouin culture and with nomadic lifestyle uh, was little more than sand, stones and a few huts. So until the um, 1930s, uh, the Qatari economy depended on almost ex exclusively upon pearl diving. Uh, nowadays, all the remains uh, of that time are few uh, narrow streets. Um, and as you can see here, souks uh, in its uh, capital, Doha. These maps show um, how Doha developed over, uh, let's say, uh, over just over 60 years from um, 1947. This is the prior to discovery of the oil and the gas. Uh, and, uh, and, and as you can see, sort of uh, Doha Bay is here. And then as of discovery of oil and gas, as you see the uh, rapid urbanization, 70s, 80s, 90s. And then by the time 2000, you see the Doha Bay, the West Bay, and, and has all developed uh, within, again, a very short amount of time. Uh, with this uh, incredible speed of modernization, uh, uh, you know, you would question how, how they keep their traditions alive. And, and I think this is uh, particularly a very critical uh, question to us, um, a generation of architects, because today uh, we are living such a fast life. And uh, we must ask ourselves how an uh, act of creation would contribute to our societies in preserving tradition and culture. Um, in other words, a very human value 
uh, and uh, staying human in such a rapid change of modernization uh, in this digital age. And let's talk about the urbanization of shopping uh, as it is perhaps more relevant to today's uh, project discussion. Um, left is uh, Souk Wakif, uh, uh, and it was a gathering place for Bedouins and locals. Uh, they uh, traded a, a, a variety of goods, uh, primarily livestock. Uh, however, the boom in prosperity in the 1990s uh, and the Souk fell in decline uh, by the time uh, 2000 uh, came in and then most of it was destroyed in a fire. Uh, and then 2006, uh, it was uh, renovated. Uh, but, uh, you know, by then, uh, this new uh, mall of Qatar was built, uh, one of the largest mall today, uh, half million square meters. Um, and, and when you look at uh, the um, plan uh, of uh, Souk Wakit, uh, Wakif, uh, if you like, uh, you know, if more labyrinthian and uh, if I may say more organic uh, in terms of uh, experiential aspect, the quality of, uh, of the space uh, versus, uh, the, of course, the Mall of Qatar, for instance, just like uh, modern walls, uh, you know, malls uh, anywhere else, uh, uh, linear and, and, and axial. So in other words, very predictable. Um, Souk Wakif uh, was a place of gathering and uh, social interactions. Um, and it's really, it was about exchanging the crafted goods uh, 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 from uh, locally, uh, locally uh, created. And, uh, and this was again prior to oil and the gas, the discovery of oil and the gas. So the quality of space is a rather um, very narrow and intimate spaces. And, uh, and it, it, it is about discovery and exploration. And it can be quite, as opposed to frustrating at times as I experienced, if you were uh, to look for a specific shop. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, it is a very much a human experience and, uh, and then I must say that this was also built by hand with the natural and the organic materials. Um, and and as in contrast to uh, Souk Wakif, uh, this is uh, the mall of Qatar, uh, typical shopping experience today, uh, as you can see, uh, I suppose you, you can see around the world. And, and, and if I may quote, according to uh, Rem Kuhas, uh, talking about the shopping malls today, uh, when air conditioning escalators and advertising appeared, shopping expanded its scale, but also limited its spontaneity, and it became much more predictable and almost scientific. And 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 this is uh, quite an interesting um, quote. And uh, and moving on to uh, another um, uh, shopping district. Uh, in Qatar, uh, let's say Qatar's very own little Venice uh, with pastel colored low rise buildings, uh, intricate canals and pedestrian friendly piazzas. Uh, the waterways evoke, of course, the soul of the Italian Romans, if you like. Uh, and this was Qatar's attempts to challenge such scientific and formulated, uh, according to Kuhas, but the shopping mall experience uh, that um, you know Qatar didn't, as Qatar did not have any precedent to go off. Uh, so, if you imagine, uh, they needed to look to the world for inspiration. On the contrary, the National Museum of Qatar uh, was an opportunity for uh, Qatari to draw inspiration from their culture and nature. Uh, to, to rediscover their own identities. The mission uh, is to connect the past to the present, a uh, celebration of both the old, uh, as you can see, and, and the new, 
as you've shown uh, in, in the logo. So let's start with the uh, old. So the old palace is at the heart of the museum. Uh, so this was uh, uh, before they discover, of course, the oil and the gas. Uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, the condition of uh, the desert uh, meeting the sea, the characteristic, characteristics of uh, the Qatari landscape. But the palace was once uh, a seat of government and, and, and from here they served people. And today, uh, as the museum uh, has completed and, and the museum was designed by Jean Nouvel and his team, um, as you can see, the old palace uh, was uh, restored and, uh, and then the new structures uh, being uh, proposed and built uh, to respect and uh, give homage to the, um, the cultural heritage of the old palace. And, then, and, and in the aerial form, uh, aerial view, uh, as you can see, so this is the National uh, Museum Qatar. Um, you know, Museum of Islamic Art by I.M. Pei. So as you can see, uh, these two, uh, if you like, uh, the jewels of the museum, the cultural institutions, uh, creates a sort of a point of uh, difference in, um, uh, uh, you know, the exper ex experience that uh, you don't see in, a, I suppose, more homogeneous, uh, you know, uh, urbanization of the cities. Uh, that we experience trace today across the world. And, and moving to interiors of uh, museum, um, we were invited to um, international competition in 2009 and uh, uh, won five areas of interiors within the museum. Um, so those uh, were the um, we gift shops, we did the two gift shops, uh, Desert Rose Cafe, uh, the Cafe 875, um, and G1 Restaurant, G1 Terrace, and VIP Room. Um, and then uh, this is the map of the museum. Uh, so this is the old palace, uh, and then the new uh, structures uh, wraps around it uh, in circles. And as you enter through uh, the museum, uh, you will be greeted uh, with these two gift shop that um, we designed and built. So this is the entry gateway, if you like. And then as you move uh, towards the museum, uh, you start from the formation of Qatar. And then as you move towards uh, the museum, uh, you would come across this point, which was the modern beginning of the modern history of Qatar around 70s. And, and then as you keep working, you would uh, uh, you know, instantly uh, notice the dramatic change in landscape and urbanization of the uh, uh, Qatar and, and uh, transform the mass uh, rapid transformation of the country. And, and then uh, you eventually uh, come back to the old palace. Uh, and uh, so this was the um, museum um, journey around two kilometer long. And the museum gift shop, uh, as you um, as you come up, uh, this escalator has uh, you know one's the museum gift shop, and this is uh, the children's gift shops. Uh, each has a two entry point. So as you as you starting the museum journey, as well as ending the museum journey, uh, you know uh, generating the the sight line uh, back into the uh, the two uh, gift shops. This is uh, one of the uh, first sketch uh, I did to explain the experience of the tra traditional soup to my team. Uh, incidentally, this turn in, turned into uh, the circulation of the gift shop and I suppose the experience in itself from the, the cult cultural heritage of the souk uh, inspired the gift shop. Um, we map uh, one of the uh, visitors uh, circulation patterns of the gift shop. And uh, as you can see, uh, it is quite a, uh, you know, me meandering and uh, uh, very organic uh, circulation, just like uh, you, you saw it in um, uh, Souk Wakit. And um, uh, this is the um, children's gift shop 
the scale gets even more intimate uh, in this children's uh, version to a uh, gift, gift shop for children. And uh, in an ideal world, I suppose uh, this would be uh, the kids journey uh, through the space, but generally, you know, they explore uh, where they want. So we created this kids, kids room or rather discover under the uh, Nouvelle's uh, discs uh, that were too, too low for adults. Uh, you know, uh, this became the kids uh, play playroom. And uh, even today, while parents are shopping, uh, you know, they'll be assisted, uh, uh, kids will be assisted to stay in this area. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then also um, incidentally uh, in the sightline of the rest of, from the rest of the space. To give you an idea of the scale of the museum gift shop, uh, around 20 meter long and by 18, eight, eight meter high, uh, the space was obviously underneath interlocking uh, discs uh, designed by uh, John Nouvelle and his team. Uh, so we have to really work hard to establish uh, space. In other words, sort of making sense of space that initially was uh, almost too organic uh, to understand and, and apply the function of the gift space. But nevertheless, um, we managed to um, create the space that uh, just enough uh, for the functions uh, for the gift shops. And, and, and now I move on to um, uh, talk, talk about the inspiration behind this space. Um, and Qatar uh, Natural Heritage in Desert Scape uh, was one of our uh, starting point. And, and, and let's say for the museum, John Nouvelle and his team explored uh, the desert uh, to find inspiration in, in this uh, desert rose uh, crystals uh, to represent Qatar's identity uh, in a symbolic way. Uh, desert rose, uh, why uh, it's symbolic, uh, let's say uh, in a simple term, Crystallize, this is a crystallization of the desert, but without water underneath it, it would not grow. Uh, so uh, we can say that this is a highly symbolic meaning of life. Uh, and, uh, you know, in desert, as you can imagine, water is, is very precious. And this is the completion of uh, the National Museum of Qatar uh, area of view. Um, and, and, uh, and we look to uh, Cave of Light uh, located in the heart of Qatar. And as I suppose, we wanted to create a synergy and uh, uh, with uh, the museum structure in itself, but look to another form of uh, crystallization and uh, by way of doing this reflecting John Nouvelle's architecture. And our gift shops are made of uh, solid timber. Timber is uh, living and organic material and perhaps reminiscence, reminiscent of uh, natural materiality of traditional souk. Um, and our choice of material was also inspired by the citra tree Qatar's uh, natural tree and symbol of oasis in the desert. Qatar is one of the driest country in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the average temperature, and this is from uh, 1940s to um, 2015, um, uh, more or less the, you know, the heat uh, goes up to uh, 30 degree plus. And then the peak uh, extreme heat uh, would reach above uh, 40 degrees, even closer to 50 degrees. And of course, the human temperature, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you like, is around 36 degrees. And obviously, we would not, we would, uh, not bear anything that above uh, 40 degrees. And tree, uh, on the other hand, body temperature is about um, 21 degrees. And, and, uh, and then it would struggle to live uh, anything above 30 degrees, um, if not supported by the artificial means. So the context of uh, looking at Qatar, uh, use of timber 
uh, become a, a quite a challenging fact, uh, especially uh, you know in a desert. Uh, there is no tree as such, and 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 this one, the citra tree, uh, is also uh, is the iconic symbol of the country heritage. So we were very keen to uh, utilize uh, the timber uh, for this museum. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, and, and, and over time, um, the uh, timber, when you look back to the past, uh, you know, it in, in somewhat disappeared from, um, from the Qatar uh, a, a traditional sense, but uh, the use of timber in the past in making traditional uh, ship called Dao, uh, so this ship uh, uh, is called Dao, uh, is an integral part of Qatari culture. And uh, especially before the oil era, they were uh, used for uh, pearl diving, uh, fishing and transport, transporting goods. And I suppose the significance of Dao uh, was for trading and the commerce. And, and today, to keep uh, those traditions alive, the Asian crop still serves the people of Qatar and perhaps the reminder of their heritage against the backdrop of modern uh, skyscrapers. And the gift shop is also uh, characterized by the uh, timber uh, materials. And the timber, uh, when you uh, slice the uh, uh, tree, the growth rings of timber evokes passage of time and reveal uh, its age. So when we study this timber, uh, which uh, could not be uh, locally sourced, so we uh, work with the Italian carpenters, uh, uh, Claudio Di Voto uh, from Rome, and, and, and obviously we source the FSC certified timber source but uh, a use of, let's say, the European timber, European oak in uh, context of uh, extreme, extreme heat in Doha was a very challenging uh, uh, fact. So how do we deal with that uh, challenge? So uh, in dealing with uh, Qatar's ex extreme heat, we study char characteristics of timber shrinkage and the distortion. So, uh, as you can see, when you have the uh, cross grain of timber, the shrinkage is less, but the longer side uh, uh, would uh, have more shrinkage and the distortion. So naturally, when you uh, cut the, the block of timber, you're trying to uh, establish the short cross section as much as possible. Uh, so uh, minimize the uh, shrinkage of the timber. So this was, for instance, the close-up of a uh, timber um, piece that was jointed, and you can see where the grain is going. And uh, so this, this grain direction uh, would have a less expansion, but some of this uh, would have uh, bigger expansions. Um, and, and we tested uh, uh, in this was in uh, uh, Claudio's um, uh, factories in, in Rome. And uh, we, we looked to, um, you know, we left these timbers for months. And as you can see, uh, depending on the humidity, so this corner uh, grew from 30 to uh, mil millimeters to uh, up to 30, 32.6. And, uh, and, 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 and let's say around one, milli, one millimeters uh, in an Italian um, context uh, where you have more humidities. And, and then um, based on the characteristics, we determined uh, this, um, uh, we chose the solid timber and, and not veneered um, and created this finger joint of solid wood uh, and having the shorter lengths uh, meant that more stabilities was achieved. Um, and also uh, by making it less, uh, uh, carry less embodied energy, uh, which also caused, uh, uh, you know, cracking and the movement. Um, so this was uh, wrapped in a, a trolley. Uh, 
uh, sorry, with the package in the plastic to um, control some level of humidity when this was transported. Uh, and we gone through the three climate passages. Um, when we shipped uh, from Italy it was around 12% humidity. Uh, by the time they arrived in Doha, uh, it was dropped to 8% um, humidity in containers. Uh, so we, we had to unwrap and let timber breathe uh, uh, so that it would get to 10% humidities uh, on site. And, and this was a perfect condition for installation. So uh, a climatizing process took between one to three months. Uh, and this was important process uh, in preparation before installation. Uh, this is uh, original gift shop space uh, before installation. And you can also see the AC diffusers on the floor designed by uh, John Novell's uh, team. Uh, and uh, we had to uh, di divert and uh, uh, this is a way, so you see this sort of a twisted timber element uh, uh, that uh, work with the positioning of those diffusers and redirect the airflow uh, to optimize uh, the humidities uh, within the gift shop uh, up around 10% and around 21 degree, which timber uh, seems to live. And, and, and again, timber is the living materiality. And we also did not apply the finished coating, but the natural oil. So this is very much a raw uh, materialities as it stands today. Another aspect of this project was innovation. So this complex structure would not have been possible without use of innovation and sophisticated technology. Um, it, it takes many, many, many years for desert rose to crystallize in nature, uh, sometimes around 10 to 100 years. Uh, so this is what nature does. And of course, artificially uh, speaking, Nouvelle Desert Rose took around a decade, let's say nine to 10 years to realize to uh, today's um, completion. And um, uh, so you can see with a, uh, you know, what nature does over time, what we do as a humans to create the structures, uh, a, a kind of interesting contrast, uh, looking at the passage of time, as you see in the timber growth rings, uh, that the timber itself also goes back to many, many years that would be installed as a frozen time uh, in, in the museums. Um, and this is the uh, entrance to the cave of light in our inspiration. Uh, and we look to this um, another form of crystallization and uh, it sort of shows different from the desert rose crystallization. This shows the stratification uh, of the crystallization uh, done by nature and one, uh, you know, strata of the crystallization uh, move down and the other one uh, forming up to, to create the cave. So the process of the formation, uh, uh, we research and then study that uh, translated into part of uh, the organic curvature that um, the straight versus this sort of uh, more organic uh, wavy formation uh, just like the sun dune, and that's translated into a uh, three-dimensional puzzle, if you like. And, uh, and, and we had the, uh, every piece is unique shape, uh, and there's nothing that is repeated. So it was, uh, you know, we had to individually uh, code it for the installation. So the nesting process, uh, uh, you know, uh, was to allow up to 2,000 pieces uh, at the time. Uh, and, and then computer would figure out uh, this sort of nesting process uh, among 2,000 different species of timber and, and also equally uh, minimize the wastage uh, with, in a way that uh, these pieces was created. So altogether 70,000 pieces for both shops 
and uh, each had the unique code and no two pieces were the same. So as you can see, um, it, we uh, created uh, these uh, timber pieces uh, in Rome and, and in another aspect uh, for the engineering of this gift shop uh, is the tessellation. And, and as you can see, and we had to sort of use the uh, you know, computer technology to make sure that these joint, that each piece of timber, uh, make sure that joint never align. Uh, when it, uh, so to make sure that uh, you know, this would not crack and uh, so this is the, the, the best way to install uh, and avoid uh, the, you know, the crack uh, of the timber. And, and, and so this is how it's built. As you can see, each joint uh, sort of uh, staggered uh, and uh, stuck on top of each other. Uh, and of course, the, each piece has different grain. And another things that perhaps you don't experience from this photo is the wonderful uh, the scent of timber. Uh, so this was uh, stuck uh, 300 pieces, uh, but due to the uh, climatization process, the timber did expand it uh, around uh, less than one mil. But when you stuck over 300 uh, pieces, we had to get rid of one uh, stratum, if you like, uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, what we wanted. Um, and. Um, Another engineering process is that we, we uh, accommodate this point, which becomes the structural locations. And uh, these lines indicate uh, where the next piece uh, will come uh, on top. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, this is part of the details that uh, we achieved. Um, and, 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 and we would like to call uh, this sort of gift shop as architecture within architecture. Uh, and, and this is perhaps an uh, important aspect to talk about uh, the relationship with Jean Nouvelle's architecture. Uh, we created the self-supporting structure. Uh, as you can see, this is the uh, Jean Nouvelle's uh, interlocking disks. Uh, we created uh, a structure that never uh, touches uh, the um, structure uh, of the museums. Um, and, um, and in itself is freestanding. Uh, we began installation with uh, this shelf. Uh, we had to create the space, a place where we applied services. Uh, and, uh, and then we built uh, from bottom up and from this shelf uh, upwards. And the, this is uh, another important aspect of uh, construction. Uh, uh, Claudio and his team uh, invented a custom uh, system of steel plate. We call them wings. Uh, and uh, this was attached to the timber pieces to the main st uh, steel structure uh, behind the timber cladding. What this uh, was enable us to do uh, is uh, you sort of see from here, so you have uh, John Nouvelle's uh, interlocking uh, disks and we have a timber piece in between and this is not touching the piece except on the floor. So when you go closer, you see uh, this 10 mil shadow gap that follows the, the contours of the interlocking disks, but never uh, touch uh, the main museum structure. So this was the gift shop, as you can see, again, uh, the 10 mil shadow gap there. And this was a, quite a complex process to accomplish with certain precision, perhaps on the uh, men, you know, the handcrafted uh, by the Claudio and, the, uh, and the, his team, uh, uh, without that wouldn't have been possible. And, and a lot of uh, site adjustment. So the lastly, I wanna talk about the Moonlight Glow uh, which is, it was the concept for the lighting. Uh, obviously the moon shines because its surface reflects the light from the sun. And, and despite the fact that it sometimes seems to shine very brightly, the moon reflects only between three to 12% of the sunlight that hits it. So this was the uh, 
as opposed to the rock or the crystal uh, of the uh, cave of light uh, when we visit it. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it, it's almost sounds like it's a very frail uh, element. So you could, you could scrape the surface quite easily, uh, but when it's crystallized and accumulate and and and, and create this uh, stratification of of the structure, the element, uh, it start to create what they call the moonlight effect, uh, which is the reflection, the main light, and then gradually uh, disappears in the fades. So the idea was was uh, translated with the main lighting system that that uh, sort of uh, apply and uh, and the phase away uh, as it comes down. Um, this was before the light, and this was after the light, and this was before the light, and then this was after the light, and and this is. Um, uh, sort of the film we took um, uh, when we just completed and uh, uh, the gift shop installation was uh, just uh, done underneath it. So as you can see, the light uh, on the shelf part uh, is uh, quite well lit for the functional purpose, uh, but above uh, the datum that we establish, uh, this creates that, um, you know, the cave, you know, just like the cave of light, that uh, you know, the moonlight glow, the effect of the moonlight glow, and 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 that created the very dramatic ambience uh, in a gift shop setting. Um, uh, one of the last uh, slide. Uh, so this was the uh, rendered image, uh, and uh, uh, I just I wanted to show this uh, towards the end because when we design and uh, you know, visualize the space, uh, I suppose not many people believed that uh, this was possible to build. Um, and, and obviously this could not uh, have done without uh, uh, the collaboration and teamwork and uh, especially uh, Claudio Devoto uh, from Rome. And uh, I suppose he would uh, describe it this project as a sense of craziness. As you can see, uh, he's given this timber piece mentioning that the crazy project, crazy architects, uh, crazy carpenters together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pritchi. Excellent lecture. Jasper, I think you're going to on the questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Uh, it, it's really amazing just to see the details and the effort that has gone into producing a marvelous project. There are a few project, uh, questions that we have come across now. I uh, just wanted to uh, present those questions to you. One of the questions from Carolina Caponi. Uh, is how do you think architecture will change in the next 50 years? Sorry, I can't hear your question. No, I actually, just here, we're trying to get Carolina. She's here as a panelist now to ask the question herself. Okay, sure, sure. If Carolina's now on the panel. She can unmute on video if she likes and ask the question directly and maybe augment it, update it. Hi, Carolina. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, Koichi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, just um, really fascinating hearing uh, um, your presentation and uh, how the organic journey developed through the years and uh, brought you to the uh, the amazing project that uh, you know the the space in Qatar was just uh, unbelievable. I, I was lucky enough to uh, visit it myself. So. Uh, I just wanted to like, understand what's your point of view um, in terms of uh, what's what's happening in architecture and uh, what's gonna what's gonna happen and how architecture is gonna change in the next fifty years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, th I think they. Um, uh, we have experienced. Uh, this so-called crisis uh, in pandemic 
uh, situation of COVID-19 today. And equally, um, we have, uh, you know, the climate change uh, matters that um, we need to, I suppose, quickly address. And uh, so-called these crises, and, and as I see most of my project, I suppose uh, starting off, uh, you know, other people may see something that is negative, but we saw it as an opportunity uh, to create, uh, you know, architecture. Uh, and, and, and of course, this include, uh, you know, nature, very much a nature, a big part of uh, our architecture. And moving forward, we must be uh, responsible for a uh, more sustainable and a conscious future. And crisis, I think, you know, that uh, as we experience today, uh, has a lot of uh, inspiration to turn uh, architecture of 20th century, uh, and as I call it, very much inspired by uh, in industrial revolution and the modernism came, we need to turn this into a natural revolution and moving forward, uh, create the environment that, that um, we can pass it to the next generation. And, and then more and more, uh, we think of this, and in Qatar was very much uh, idea of uh, drawing inspiration from the cultural and as opposed to natural heritage so that uh, we, they would remember as, we, as they move forward towards the rapid urbanization. And then I think this part of heritage and let's say the identity crisis today, uh, as opposed to across many cultures due to globalization is another element in which uh, we need to address through architecture. And as opposed to the National Museum of Qatar was very much a, a great opportunity to perhaps demonstrate one possibilities uh, in looking to uh, the past uh, to draw inspiration, uh, but very much uh, uh, creating a progressive architecture that lasts, uh, let's say, for the future, moving forward to the passing to the next generation. Thank you, Karichi. Hey, I hope that answered your question, Carolina. Uh, we're moving on to the next question. Uh, Hoffman. Hello. Uh, my question was, how did you, like, how were you able to combine between nature and architecture in such an aesthetic way? And how was the designing process? I think... Um... <clears throat> I, I don't know, for me, um, as I, you know, go through my careers, um, I realized that I suppose uh, I never like buildings. And uh, because, uh, you know, I love nature so much as, you, as I grew up uh, in different cities uh, and fortunate enough to experience uh, when back in Japan, where we had uh, more nature, where I grew up, and today you look to uh, the city, essentially there's no nature. And experiencing that uh, really um, inspired me to be an architect and not just to create buildings, but to you know, recover nature in some way or reconnect uh, with uh, nature and natural environment, perhaps through architecture. Uh, so uh, most of my project uh, was, I suppose, uh, you know, idea of creating and, and of course the element in which we respond to the commercial aspect of functions but architecture itself should should embody uh, something that uh, uh, appeal to uh, emotion and as, as opposed something something that um, you know uh, preserve the human values moving forward uh, as I call it humanizing architecture. And I think the nature uh, has a, a, a lot of a source of inspiration uh, to achieve this goal. 
Thank you so yeah. much. The next one we have is from Karim Nidan. Go ahead, Karim. Karim, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, good day to you guys. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you. Uh, my question to Koichi is, uh, me as a student, I am facing this uh, concern with the, this new technology and the new advancement of architecture using uh, rendering softwares. So as an example uh, that you showed us, uh, Koichi, uh, the bookshelves that used uh, natural elements of uh, twisting and uh, using uh, several types of woodings, uh, using the software, uh, uh, do you think it, it affected the concept uh, of the design? Do you think it affects uh, someone's approach to design in architecture? I think, um, look, first of all, uh, let me say this. I think a um, place like Qatar uh, needs artificial intervention because of the extreme um, climate and uh, condition in which perhaps uh, we can learn uh, moving forward uh, to the future uh, in dealing with the climate change and technology, and I suppose including uh, uh, you know computer technology, let's say, and I suppose the coding is part of the process, uh, is to enable uh, us to create the new relationship with the nature even at that extreme conditions. And urban farming, for instance, I'm quite fascinated. Uh, with uh, the uh, minimum use of water in an urban environment, uh, you could create this unbelievable uh, uh, produce uh, in, in a, a most uh, ideal conditions. And, and the, the marrying between, let's say, the nature and, and the artificial intelligence uh, in this aspect, uh, you would see uh, many uh, possibilities uh, as, as we also demonstrate in the sunflower house uh, we, we were quite excited, uh, you know, to see this, this type of intervention and, and, and perhaps Qatar was in a way a good uh, 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 testing ground or the good experience that we had, if you like, the warm up uh, for uh, looking to the future. And, and we cannot do this without the computer in a many sense. And let's say the technology, the use of artificial means uh, to reconnect with nature and, 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 in, and increasingly dealing with the climate change. This is, uh, and, 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 a, and a more day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, learning about this technology as an opportunity to, to embody a new relationship with nature is becoming uh, apparent. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I can add to my question also, but do you think generally uh, using or relying on rendering uh, softwares uh, limits us architects into seeing a um, uh, future of, of designing or, uh, you know, achieving a concept or achieving the, 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 the true essence of our intentions to design? Uh, we, uh, we at some point need to visualize, to communicate. And I think the visualization is the great still today a great tools to uh, communicate, uh, I suppose even certain extent without uh, language. And uh, in a case of this project in Qatar, uh, because uh, you know, it, it takes so long to learn uh, the local language, uh, you know, nature is an alternative means or the rendering, the visualization is an altern alternative means for the communications. And uh, I believe that still today a very much important uh, tools uh, to visualize uh, your vision and uh, you know your ideas uh, so that um, you can bridge uh, the gap between uh, other you know uh, cultural differences. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to the next question from Matthew. Matthew's a uh, member hello. of the Golf chapter, actually, in our, in our committee. Yes, um, uh, hi, Koichi. Um, 
br brilliant presentation. Uh, thank you for the explanation of your process. Um, I just wanted to say, so I love the way that you use wood uh, as a material. I think it's quite effective in how it um, creates like a multi architecture. I just wanted to know if you thought that there were any other materials that were as effective in doing this. Um, uh, wood, obviously, uh, uh, very, uh, very much a part of the traditional materials, uh, you know, for my Japanese heritage background. And uh, I grew up uh, in, a, you know, obviously, a, you know, timber structured house. And, uh, you know, always uh, we were, I was um, as, as surrounded with this uh, wonderful forest and nature uh, well, back in the days uh, in Tokyo. And uh, the wood was something that I knew intuitively uh, uh, from a childhood. And uh, today, uh, you know, we obviously as a practice use other materials uh, but because of the, um, you know, regulations and, and in terms of the fire and uh, increasingly difficult to uh, use uh, the natural materials such as wood uh, in a large and high rise building. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have to overcome this, but equally uh, we are looking at the hybrid of natural and artificial uh, use of uh, materials uh, as, as a, uh, you know, potential uh, to express uh, the intent uh, of, uh, you know, the look and feel. And, and uh, uh, this is also uh, becoming part of uh, exploration that, that we take uh, these days uh, based on uh, the, the region and the climate and, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, I don't know whether I answer your question, but the wood itself is the starting point. And then from that, we, we, we are currently looking at different variation of, I suppose, the marriage of, uh, you know, the engineered uh, timber to, you know, combination of the artificial materialities in, in some part that mimic uh, the natural in artificial and, and, and we, we, uh, uh, we don't want to sort of, uh, uh, you know, eliminate all the options that are available to us. But in case of Qatar, uh, you know, it was very much a case of a uh, very strong position that we took from the beginning with the clients that this needed to be uh, uh, the solid wood. And, and this is symbolized uh, the heritage of uh, Sidra tree. And, and there was a lot of symbolic meaning uh, uh, or pro prosperity and growth uh, in, in this particular trees that protected from the, the harsh nature in this, this instance. So uh, I, I really uh, fell in love with that stories and, and wanted to make sure that this solid timber was as natural as, as, as possible uh, in, in uh, realizing this project. Thanks very much. Next is my Yeah, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, okay. Yes, we, can, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Ahead, please. Uh, uh, one thing definitely I felt because uh, since uh, the question of identity and the question of uh, how the project relates to the local uh, cultural characteristics, it always remains in mind. So one thing I must congratulate you that uh, it has got a huge cultural value and that uh, uh, it has got a universal appeal because it's it, it's not it just doesn't pinpoint to only one specific culture but it's got a huge universal appeal so actually when i was looking at uh, your presentation it was like as if i was walking inside a sculpture you know it's the sculpture is wrapped around you because usually when you see a sculpture you 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 walk around the sculpture <laughs> and and you see it from different sides and uh, so this uh, this project uh, uh, has this unique uh, characteristic where you're actually being surrounded by this beautiful sculpture, and uh, which is a very unique uh, uh, value which has come up because it, it doesn't relate to any specific culture because you take uh, Eastern architecture or Western architecture or any other architectural styles or everything, 
uh, except for huge uh, uh, colossal temples where you could wrap your wrap architecture around you. So this definitely has that feel of sculpture wrapping you. So was there a conscious approach? That's one thing I would like to ask you. Like when you were sketching or doodling or when you were imagining these things, was there a conscious approach to do this, keep this universal appeal? I think the nature has universal appeal. And when we present it for competition, uh, like I mentioned, uh, because um, normally I would present in English uh, to the culture that we, you know, uh, we have a project normally an English speaking country or Japanese, which I would understand. And in some sense, even in China, I would understand the characters. So uh, there's a ways in which we, I can communicate with the words. But in this instance, uh, my first uh, you know, encounter with the, the Middle Eastern culture uh, uh, was, was quite a um, challenging one, if you like. So the, the nature itself was the, you know, the great uh, way to communicate. And of course the nature, nothing is straight. And if you like, if you borrow your words, I suppose it's maybe more emotional and sculptural. Uh, the quality of the emotion, expressing emotion was not um, you know, intended uh, from a beginning, but uh, as you experience the culture, as, as I was introduced to the culture uh, uh, within Qatar, you know, such as the uh, souk, uh, you know, the majlis setting, the dining, uh, which was very similar experience to my fond memory of tatami mat from Japan. And, uh, you know, you connect with this sort of language of, of behavior and, 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 a, and a traditional act, if you like. And, and we, could, we could sort of share that, that feeling and, and that precise way of exchanging the emotion in feeling uh, was, was the way to, uh, was the way in which it was appreciated during the competitions. So, and in other words, uh, we were told that we, first of all, uh, was one of, one, of the, one of the few that express, uh, 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 respect their culture uh, and their tradition uh, within our scheme. Uh, but also uh, we, we could express the emotion in a way that perhaps, and, and a bit similar to uh, my heritage uh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, we, were, we were sort of, not uh, come from this sort of uh, expressive, but more reserve, uh, you know, cultural background in which expressing through this uh, form of architecture uh, was almost, uh, you know, the act of, if you like, the art. And uh, so the idea of the gift shop uh, was not to just turn this function into uh, a space uh, but it was idea of uh, evoking that emotion. And, and if I may say, uh, this project as you walk in and uh, it, it, it's quite emotional. And every time you walk in, uh, it, it, is a, uh, it, it sort of uh, gives you a different emotional experience during the morning to the nighttime. And, and as I go back every so often, I, I uh, you know, get this emotion. And I think that emotion is a very much important part of uh, design tool. Thanks, Koichi. Next we Thank have Thank you. Amy, Amy Lam. Amy is uh, a, a RIB representative from Saudi Arabia. Amy, please go ahead. Hi, Koichi. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, Good to see you on the this morning. Uh, thanks for sharing the project, which is, I find it very, um, uh, like you said, this is, is a challenging site. Uh, and I think uh, the the spectacular space in itself that you manipulated within is, is really a, a great example to see um, in this, particularly in this region. Uh, my question is actually following up to the previous uh, uh, questions about culture and identity. Um, you just you you spoke about you being having the uh, a Japanese heritage. You know you're based in Australia, and you're doing projects worldwide, which is a lot of architectural practices are doing. Uh, one of my question, having been based in Saudi Arabia for twelve years, is that um, there is a sense that 
the vernacular architecture of his country, of his place, uh, has been slightly lost with the, um, with the work by uh, Western architects. Um, and there is always a debate about how much of that influence uh, from external practice to be within the Gulf countries so that we don't end up you know, having different Gulf cities looking the same, whether it's Dubai, uh, Riyadh or et cetera. Uh, what is your view on on this in terms of um, uh, you know in terms of work that is imported into a culture where it has a very deep rooted uh, uh, from from its architecture to its uh, original uh, cultural aspect? I think um, every project, um, ideally, we have much more time. Uh, to explore and research and, you know, deal with that, let's say, that cultural identities. And, uh, and, and today's uh, uh, building a program, um, you know, and looking even at the Jean Nouvel's process of building that structure, let's say, took nine to 10 years, it's quite a fast uh, construction program. And uh, for that size, size of the project and given that complexities. And, uh, and, and, and Qatar in itself, as I presented the urbanization over the last 50 to 60 years, been astonishing. And as I suppose other Gulf region uh, experiencing the same. And, and, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, the danger of that is to, uh, you know, uh, uh, losing that, that sort of a sense of uh, ind indigenous uh, local identities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then another way of looking at it is that uh, because in, in some ways in which uh, we, we can be a translator and, 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 and from, from our backgrounds and uh, suppose experiences as an architect, and, and I suppose in this project, it came down to, uh, if I may say, the attitude in, in which we brought the humbleness to the project to begin with. So when we presented the competition, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we tried to uh, respect uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the culture. Uh, and, and obviously when we were invited, uh, we could not visit the place. So we were almost doing this blindfolded condition mm -hmm. and eventually presented uh, in front of the clients uh, without essentially knowing the place. And this was very difficult process, but thankfully uh, the process in itself took over nine years uh, because we had to wait uh, for the main structure to get built. And, uh, and, and, and for time in which to understand the space itself, we had to rely on the 3D simulated virtual uh, program and and when you when I visited first eventually after winning the competition visited the site uh, there was no way in which we would understood the space itself in a conventional sense because it was so complex and in a cultural sense it was almost impossible to uh, understand uh, in, in almost no time to uh, to embody the architecture that embedded in the cultural heritage but what happened is over those nine years, uh, because of the process in which we converse and, and uh, you know, discuss uh, this with the clients and uh, Qatari locals, uh, this really opened up um, uh, different possibilities in the project in many ways uh, evolve and, mm -hmm. and start to sort of, uh, you know, involve other peoples to in some way contribute uh, to the aspect of architecture. So the parts that obviously I didn't show for other elements, we also e equally designed concurrent, concurrently to parallel to the gift shop, in fact, had changed dramatically, even from uh, our design point of view, because of the conversation. And I think the gift shop was one of the uh, only one that uh, perhaps stayed as more, uh, you know, close to the original competition design. But nevertheless, uh, in terms of uh, the you know the idea of 
creating the gift shop, the function in itself sort of uh, change uh, over the time. And, and in the culturally speaking, that really helped to understand. And, and, and we, we were quite, uh, you know, we brought the team of people that uh, were happy to listen to uh, clients. And, and we were also told by the clients that obviously other, uh, you know, inter international architects uh, would come and, and create that sort of sense of conflict to achieve that, um, you know, the original, you know, creative uh, intention, but we were rather the opposite uh, to, you know, we wanted to be, it's perhaps the listener more so than uh, involving and uh, directing the project. And, and that, uh, you know, allow us to, uh, you know, understand the culture uh, so much better. Uh, so by the time uh, the project was realized, obviously we had the, you know, uh, 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 senior architects uh, on site uh, every day and, uh, and the communication flew and by the time the other teams and, 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 and Amy, as you understand, uh, living in, in your region, uh, you would need to rely on the uh, expertise outside the, uh, you know, the, the site in the location, the Doha, uh, such as, you know, uh, the, the master carpet, uh, coming from Italy and, and even we research um, uh, the trades uh, and the, sorry, the builders that could, could actually realize our design into reality. Mm. I think there was only three uh, possibly international location that uh, could turn this building into realities and Claudio was one of them. So uh, relying on the local, uh, you know, a trade was, uh, you know, at the time require a lot of time time to do it, whereas bringing our knowledge from outside and, and together with, uh, I suppose, advanced state of art technology, we, we were allowed to do it so much quicker. Uh, and uh, this was also a very important part of uh, realizing this project on time. Thank you, Koshi. Thanks, Amy. Next we have is Chika. Go ahead, Chika. Okay, hello. Um, Hi. My question is, what is your advice to young architects who wish to express their um, creative intents and preserve the traditional value? That is in terms of working in a firm or being an entrepreneur. And also, um, how are you able to overcome the social pressure of being an architect? and still want to express your creative intent? Um, I couldn't hear the last part, but let, let me start by, um, uh, I think um, being an architect is, um, uh, it's a great profession. And, and as we call it, labor of love, you know, architecture, to realize architecture takes uh, such a long process and, um, you know, involve many teams and, and obviously not just design, uh, we need to integrate the team and conduct the team. So, you know, it's not just the talent of designing it, but, you know, we need to create this environment that enable us, environment as a team, enable us to realize, uh, as, as opposed uh, as complex project as uh, this museum gift shop and uh, have, having that, uh, you know, sort of a sense of direction and, and, and very much important role uh, in being, uh, the, let's say, the uh, architects in this uh, in this regard, uh, you know, is to have ability to, uh, uh, you know, uh, create, uh, you know, the conduct and create this sort of uh, uh, synergy within the team, and and to understand the challenges and 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 very much uh, our approach is 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 really about, uh, you know, teamwork. And, and, and obviously I represent uh, my practice, uh, but there was uh, many people that involved uh, in making a project like this uh, possible. Uh, but nevertheless, the vision uh, and, and the leadership, and then I, I may add uh, 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 for students that are listening to this webinar, uh, I believe that sustainability is, uh, is in, you know, depends on our leadership. And, and I think that this uh, uh, very vision itself, 
uh, uh, must come from uh, you know ourselves as an architects, and and we have abilities and I suppose some level of respect to conduct uh, and and sort of um, uh, you know bring other teams on board to achieve this mission and and, and of your vision. In from that regard, I think you know uh, I still enjoy what I do, and uh, you know and, and then. And, and thinking, thinking of uh, the future in terms of not so much, I suppose, our generation and uh, thinking of uh, my children's generation and even for the children of uh, the children's generation, our children's generation and having that continuity uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's becoming a, a very important uh, topic. And uh, uh, what was your last question? Yes, my last question was, um, as a beginner architect, like in your early stages of architecture, how were you able to overcome the social pressure during your creative process? Social? The social pressure. Pleasure? Pressure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pressure, social pressure. Social pressure. Yes. Oh, pressure, yeah. I think, uh, um, I think everybody deals with the pressure differently, but certainly, um, you know, uh, we learn to deal with that pressure in a in a different uh, form of life. And uh, I was con conversing with a journalist um, today, early morning, that often the case that you know uh, I get perhaps the ideas, or you know, uh, when I'm away from work. Uh, when when you have more breathing space, and 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 I think you know, building up a company, uh, you need to put everything every hours of your life into a practice. But there's other ways to do architecture, and uh, and and then I think that um, you know, it's 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 important to uh, you know uh, to find a way you can deal with the pressure. Certainly, I. I when I deal with the pressure in a ways that, in fact, I uh, position myself away from architecture. And uh, despite the pressure, for instance, the competition uh, that we, we run all the time, uh, instead of being in that pressure pot, you go away from that pressure environment. And sometimes, you know, that, you know, allows you to be free and, and find the inspiration that you never imagined possible before. So. You know, I think in many ways, uh, my architecture, my work itself is about, you know, creating that sense of retreat within the architecture. Uh, and without that, I think there is no breathing space and suppose there's no architecture. So, you know, practicing architecture applies to that similar uh, quality. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, hi, Koichi. I'm going to ask a question, uh, kind of picking up two questions from the audience, Francesca and Ruba have asked and combining it into one, about your design philosophy, which you've been uh, explaining through the project and presentation. Um, but looking further ahead, how can you uh, see you embedding this design philo philosophy scaling up into larger urban landscapes, such as neighborhoods and city precincts in the future, and creating a whole community that draws inspiration from nature? I think it's uh, it's a question of the let's say questioning the loss of nature uh, in cities open up definitely open up a new possibilities uh, in creating um, architecture and let's say including design and uh, you know uh, and I think this is really the key aspect of uh, uh, you know understanding in our making of our conscious future. And, 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 and I, I remember that I lived in New York City and in, in many ways, um, I was very stressed uh, living in between the buildings. Uh, as soon as you go to Central Park, New York Central Park, it has that sense of uh, space and you know, allow you to breathe again. And, and as, as opposed to moving forward, uh, you know, the greening of cities or the dealing with the climate uh, change issue uh, it's not just about 
turning uh, or what I call natural naturalizing our cities. But this is about for us, the humankind, uh, to maintain the human values uh, and to live a healthier life. You know, we, we really need to uh, sort of um, turn our profession uh, in, in, in thinking that perhaps, you know, um, loss of nature uh, to start with, uh, but, uh, you know, this re rediscovering uh, perhaps the something that fundamental in, you know, human feeling, human touch, uh, and the uh, more human centric design uh, in architecture uh, that seemed to gone away from uh, since the influence of uh, modernism today. And then across the city today, as you experience, you know, majority of that experience are quite monotonous. Uh, so we would look at um, by way of uh, dealing with or reconnecting with nature and because we deal with a different, uh, you know, the cli uh, climate uh, zones and different cultural element uh, and uh, that we could uh, rediscover the unique approach to uh, architecture and, 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 and somehow bring back that, uh, you know, the human value, uh, let's say, uh, you know, trying to stay human uh, in this uh, digital age. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Koichi. This is Jitpi here again. Uh, so it, it's been an inspiring presentation, Koichi, and I've really loved it. I've been into the space as well, and it's just uh, magnificent. Uh, we would like to thank you for your time today for presenting this project uh, to our audience. Uh, and hopefully, we would like to see amazing presentations as well in the future for a global audience that you would like to present in the coming times. So we, we would like to uh, thank everyone who's attended the presentation and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I have done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kuichi. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. We close the session.